to leave it at that. Um, what we want to try to do today is not to just give you a bunch of hard numbers and facts and your osmolarity has got to be at exactly 0 0.310 and it's got to be in just the size vein and those sorts of things. Those are all important guidelines, but one of the main things I want to do in the, in the vein that uh, Dr. Ginn has already started us down is to do things safely and effectively, to give IVs, to learn how to give IVs in a way that will be efficacious for the patient, but also will be comfortable for them. Let me tell you a little story about what will happen. Somebody will come into your office, they'll get an IV. It may be cold, it's infused cold, or it's infused at a very hypertonic uh, consistency, and they won't complain. They won't feel comfortable about saying, you know, doc or nurse, this is hurting. Can you slow it down? Can you warm it up? Can you do something to help me here? But later, uh, I as a pharmacist have heard many times those complaints when people come by to get their other medications filled or to get their supplements. And they'll come in and say things like, you know, I, I love the doctor and the, the staff is proficient, but that IV hurt and I don't think I'm going to go back. And that's not what we want. We want the patients to come back for the economic reasons. We want them to come back for reasons of improving their health. So today I want us to recognize the common ingredients of the IVs, the common doses of each. Uh, I want you to know that your main osmotic load is going to come from things like the mag chloride, the mag sulfate, the vitamin C. I want us to recognize what are the hypotonic solutions. Sterile water, trace minerals, Various other nutrients are hypotonic, and therefore that has to be taken into consideration. I want us to anticipate the common reactions that can occur. If you give a high dose of vitamin C and the patient hasn't eaten in 12 hours, they're probably going to become hypoglycemic. They're going to be feeling sweaty. Uh, they may get dizzy. If you're giving large doses of magnesium, they may feel uh, hypotensive. They may feel faint. They're going to be flushed in some cases. Uh, they may have something just short of what appears to be a niacin-like reaction where they become very red, and they're going to wonder what the heck's going on. We want to be familiar with those things. Osmolarity issues, obviously. Diluent options. As Dr. Ginn has already mentioned, water is going to be your primary diluent. There will be times that you'll want to use D5 or D2.5 and normal saline, maybe half normal saline in some cases, and we'll talk about those. We want to take a brief look at incompatibilities. What is it that you recognize when you're mixing and you say, oh, wait a minute, this is not right? Color change, precipitation, heat formation. Those are going to be the main three things you see. But we want to know what we can predict before something precipitates or clouds the bag up and you have to throw the whole thing away. So we'll look at predicting some of those things. Before we dive into osmolarity and other such uh, mundane things, let's look for a minute at why you want to do IV nutrients at all. And Dr. Ginn has already covered a lot of this. Lack of nutrients in food. I don't know how many of you may have known Bob Smith when he worked for Doctors Data up in Chicago. He did a very interesting study comparing the nutrient value as looking at trace minerals in organically grown food as compared to off-the-shelf standard grocery store food, which probably most of us eat. The food that we are eating that comes out of the can in the grocery store has nutrient levels that are just a fraction, I mean a small fraction, of what you get from organically grown vegetables. Well, who eats organically grown? We probably all do to some extent, but in the economic times we're in now, most patients are looking for what's the cheapest, not necessarily what's the best for them. So we have to examine what we're eating, where it's coming from, what the nutrient content might be. And his studies show that unless you're eating organic, at least some of the time, you're not going to get the mineral levels that you need, much less the levels of the other nutrients. Lack of food, junk diets, exotic diets, three-month peanut butter diet. You eat nothing but peanut butter for three months. And you all have all seen these crazy diets, you know. I mean, who's not going to be mineral deficient and nutrient deficient in other ways by going on these exotic diets for lengthy periods of time? Malabsorption. Randy, I know you probably remember Walt Ward, our good friend from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We lost a tremendous resource in him a few years ago when he passed away. He told of a story when he was in residency 
of a fellow, middle-aged, apparently fairly healthy. They couldn't really find anything wrong with him in his workups. But he was later hospitalized and passed away. He, Dr. Ward, that, in, that is, was in on his autopsy. And when they looked at his intestine, he described the way that it looked on the inside as being like a PVC pipe. I mean, you couldn't really see that the absorptive surface uh, really was in very good shape. And therefore, this fellow literally died of malnutrition, even though he was taking in plenty of calories and had a reasonably good diet. So there are reasons for using IV treatments, IV nutrients, at least to get a person to the point that maybe their absorptive mechanisms can be dealt with, can be improved, so that they can go it with oral therapies. All right, let's look at some contraindications first. Now, some will argue that it's impossible to be allergic to a nutrient. You give someone a vitamin C and they have an anaphylactoid or anaphylactic reaction. Why could that be? Well, if they're corn allergic, there's a possibility that some of the polysaccharide complexes from the corn may be in low concentration in the solution that's infused, therefore they react to it. Glutathione and certain other products are made from the recombinant DNA technology, and the manufacturing organism is typically Aspergillus orzae, Aspergillus niger. Um, there are Torula species that are involved in the manufacturing process in some cases. And what are all those? What do we call those? They're all yeast. Are there people you see that are allergic to yeast and mold? Absolutely. If there is antigenic material from that process that goes into that IV, there's a chance that they could have a reaction. As Dr. Ginn has already taught us, you've got to be prepared. Anaphylaxis from B12. Fairly unusual, but yet it has happened. Again, is it the microbial antigens uh, that are carried over because most B12 is from recombinant DNA technology, or is it something else? IV administration of N-acetylcysteine. This is uh, exemplary of something you want to avoid. Never give a product for chelation for removal of toxic products, whether it be metals, pesticide, herbicide, xenobiotic, whatever, unless it has some sort of a proven and known excretory pathway, okay? You give someone glutathione, it's going to excrete by the mercapturic acid uh, conjugation system or another proven pathway. What pathway does an NAC metal complex have for excretion? According to Boyd Haley and the other people on the toxicology side, it doesn't have a proven excretory pathway. You give someone IV NAC and they're loaded with heavy metals, what's going to happen? It's going to bind the metals and just redistribute them. Round and round and round it's going to go through the circulation. You may be taking what's in the liver and the gut and redistributing it to the brain. I'm not saying never give NAC, but be careful. Be knowledgeable of who you're giving it to. Oral NAC is a glutathione precursor, probably a good idea. If they had decent absorption, you don't have a problem there. Dr. Ginn has already talked about deficiency in red blood cell G6PD uh, as being a potential complication when you're giving high dose vitamin C. Most of the physicians I know do not do routine testing for that, but it is definitely something to keep in mind. <laughs> sure as you don't do it, as Dr. Ginn says, that's going to be the patient that has it. You give them a big infusion and uh, they wind up with a massive hemolytic anemia, that can be a problem. So again, as Dr. Ginn has said, start slow, start with a low dose, build up from there, be safe. The use of nutrients in patients with severe environmental illness uh, can result in allergic phenomenon. Why this is, no one seems to fully know. Uh, I had the experience of basically being educated by a lot of patients uh, through my career and one of the most interesting was to have practiced near the uh, medical practice of Dr. Orion Truss. Most people, when the name Orion Truss is mentioned, roll their eyes and say, oh, this is the yeast guy, you know, he's like Billy Crook, he's way out there, he's a nutcase or whatever. Dr. Truss was actually a very brilliant doctor. His theories were not very well accepted, but his patients were really an interesting group. Many of them apparently had some sort of malnutrition, and when they took vitamins, particularly any of the B-complex vitamins, they would have the most bizarre reactions you can imagine. 